well I hope my opponent turns up he was in the room for half an hour and he he um, he left presumably either he crashed or to go to another room so we'll hang around but uh, we've been through this before of course we've, we've had a time agreed um, for a debate and uh, the person hasn't turned up uh, this person as I say he's been in the room for half an hour he's been very chatting he's been very friendly so uh, here he is he's back in the room so I'm gonna hand uh, the debate over to Professor Preachbill who's the moderator uh, one God w one not three would you just like to um, go through the format once again or are you happy with that the professor professor knows the format because you know this is a fair room this isn't one of these rooms in power talk where it's a it's a massacre I do want to have a fair format that my opponent is is happy with over are we ready to begin yeah I'm ready to just, uh, just remember what format as far as how many minutes for opening and then the uh, actual debate and question and answer session if somebody if either you or Bob can uh, tell me how many minutes for your opening first I believe Bob said that he was going first and it was two to three minutes uh, oh you mean question and answer session I don't know I don't know if we've agreed upon that Okay, uh, one God and Bob, do you guys want the uh, room red dotted as far as mics, or how do you guys want to handle this? Well, it's quite a small room. We don't have any troublemakers at the moment. It's up to you as the moderator. You and God is one, how, how you deal with that. I explained to God is one, we have troublemakers coming in the room occasionally. Um, I'm concerned about the question and answer because we don't have any one as Pentecostals to take. Um, uh, one God, three not one side. So I do want this to be fair. Uh, if people are firing lots of questions at one God and not at me, then maybe one God could, um, in the question and answer session, ask me a question to sort of even it up and make it fair. Um, but I'll leave it up to the moderators to decide how to do that. Okay, let's get started. Let me, Bob, you be the first to go. Three minutes opening statement, sir. It is your mic. Well, I'd like to thank um, One God, Three Not One, for taking part in this debate. I think it's an important issue. Um, the title of the debate. Uh, let me, Bob, you just dropped your mic. Come back up. Sorry. The title of the debate is John 5.23 that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. The position that I take is that only Trinitarians honor the Son equally to the Father. Um, scripture says very clearly that the Son is God. He is called God in Hebrews 1.8. Unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is for ever and ever. By the way, am I coming through? Could people type one in text? If can you type one in text? Okay, my microphone's on full, Jade. I can't turn it up any higher. That's as high as I can go. So Hebrews one eight says that the Son is God. Um, the word Yahweh, although it's not used in the New Testament text, is nevertheless implied in Hebrews one ten, where Psalm one hundred and two is quoted, and the word Yahweh is applied to the Creator of Psalm one hundred and two. That Yahweh creates all things. And yet Psalm 102 is applied by God the Father to the Son of God at Hebrews 1.10. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. Do I need to give any further proof? The Son is called Lord and God at John 20.28. 20, so the position that I take is that the Son is fully and completely God. He's not a little God. He's not a second God. He's not a God as the Jehovah's Witnesses teach. Not the, I'm implying that my opponent teaches that, of course. But it is my contention that only Trinitarians honor the Son equally to the Father. And um, we find this verse equal in John 5.18. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but said that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. So the Son is equal to the Father. In the previous verse, verse 17, the Son has been sustaining 
the universe, sustaining the creation since he created the universe with the Father, according to John 5.17. The Son can do anything that the Father can do. Well, if the Son can do anything that the Father can do, in what way is the Son less than the Father? He's not less than the Father. He's equal to the Father in his deity. That's John 5.19. This is why I believe the Trinitarians honor the Son equally to the Father in John 5.23. Uh, thank you everyone. I pass the mic to my opponent. Um, one God, one not three. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I agree with a lot of what uh, Mr. Limey Bob has said, but uh, I take the position that since um, there was an incarnation that took place of uh, the Son, which was born of Mary, begotten of Mary, born of Mary, sired miraculously by the Spirit of God uh, through the virgin birth, and uh, Jesus was made both Lord and Christ at that birth because his humanity had a beginning. And uh, Acts 2.38, or Acts 2.36 says so. It says, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm breathing into my mic. <laughs> uh, he was made both Lord and Christ in Acts 2.36. In John 3.34, he was given the Spirit by no measure. Matthew 28, 18, he was given all power in both heaven and earth. And in Philippians 2, 6, of course, it said, uh, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. There's your word, equal. But uh, God cannot be equal to God. It was the man who was given the Spirit by no measure in John 3, 34, and made both Lord and Christ in Acts 2, 36, that was um, that thought it not robbery to be equal with God. God certainly would not um, think himself equal to himself. He simply is the I am, and he simply is God. Okay? Okay, I take it uh, when God you're done with your opening there. Are you done with your opening there, sir? Yes, I am. Go ahead. Okay, thank you, sir. All right, hang on. Hey, I got it down to 23%. Is this any better? Wow, I'm going to be blasting people's ears out. I had it set down to 23%. Okay, uh, Bob, for the actual debate, uh, I'm sorry, for the actual debate here, how many minutes per speaker? Please, if you let me know in text. Okay, so I take it two minutes each for the debate. Each person two minutes each. Is that my understanding I'm getting from you both? Yes or no? Okay, two minutes each. Uh, who goes first? Yes, uh, go ahead. Okay, let me, Bob, I guess you first, sir. Hang on, let me set my clock. Okay, now I agree with one God that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has a human nature. That human nature is created. That human nature lacks divine attributes. That human nature is less than the Father, John 8, John 14, 28. Um, I don't have a problem with the, the fact that Jesus Christ has a human nature. The difference between us is that I believe that the Son of God has a divine nature. John 5, 23 uses the word Son that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. You see, you can't turn around one God and say, well, the Son is the humanity of Jesus and the Father is the deity, because if you say that, you're not honoring them equally. Now, if you, if you look at the scriptures, I believe very, very clearly the scriptures teach that the Son has existed eternally with the Father. He's not merely some um, uh, created being who, who first um, appeared 2,000 years ago. If you look at John, John 17, 5, for instance, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had, past tense, with you, um, para, I think that is in the Greek, before the world was. 
the Son existed together with the Father before the world was. I think as um, one God wants to keep it very brief, I'm just going to deal one scripture at a time. So maybe if we deal with this scripture, then it'll be one God's um, turn to ask me a scripture after we've dealt with this verse. John 17, 5. Thanks, one God. I pass the mic. Okay, very good, Limey, Bob. Um, okay, you gave the passage in John 17, 5. And if the context remained in that one passage and it was isolated from all others, then um, just to gloss over the passage, you might have a point there. But the uh, context continues all the way to, well, it continues to at least verse 24, where Jesus himself said the disciples were about to witness the glory he had with the fa Father before the world was. And of course, um, you do understand, and John also wrote Revelations 13:8, where the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. Of course, John here is using language. It seems like it is literal language, and um, but we know the Lamb was not slain from the foundation of the world. Of course, um, you might take a uh, variant reading of that passage. I take the King James reading of that passage. And uh, because of other passages found in 1 Peter 1, 19 through 20 and the like. And, uh, but uh, anyhow, the, the lamb was not literally slain from the foundation of the world any more than he literally existed. The lamb, or the son, was the creator because, his, because he was made creator in the incarnation. He was God manifested in the flesh. And uh, I do not, um, I do not take away from his deity. Uh, you cannot separate his deity from his flesh because he was God from his mother's womb. Um, the Son was made both Lord and Christ. I gave that passage in Acts 2:36, and uh, nowhere do we find in the scriptures in Hebrews 1:8. Because when we read continue, when we read the continued context to verse nine, um, the Lord was um, was anointed with the oil of gladness above his fellows, and if if he was a god that preexisted, then he had fellow gods with him. That's absurd. So, so my point being, with along with your point from John seventeen five, you cannot take that language to be a literal language of pre-existence when you read the continued context to verse 24. Thank you. All right, let me jump up here for a minute, gentlemen. We're going to increase it to three minutes. I think two minutes is too short. So let's increase it to three minutes each. That's, that's what I'm going to do here. Hey, let me Bob, your response, your mic, sir. Well, I heard my opponent say this, quote, he was God from his mother's womb. Well, I disagree with that. I don't believe that the son was God from his mother's womb. Because you, 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 you can't have a God who came into existence. Um, is there a God beside me? Hebrews, um, sorry, Isaiah says, no, I know not any. You can't have somebody who becomes a God. Uh, the Son of God has eternally existed. Um, as for the Revelation passage, I'm sorry, but you can't take um, a King James Bible strange rendering and, and use it to dismiss um, a, a very clear passage, especially when so many Bibles disagree with the King James rendering. Um, as for John 17.5, I feel... I, I fail to see how the context somehow overthrows this verse. Uh, let's look at John 17, 5 again. The glory which I had with you before the world was, uh, I'm right now, I'm, I'm just checking up in a grammar book, and the preposition with is para, which can't be used of yourself. Uh, I can't say I am with myself in this debate room. Okay, I'm not with my mis uh, myself. I'm, with, I, I'm debating, I'm with other people. Now, when the word para is used, it can't be apply to say, well, uh, God is with himself, okay, as if, uh, sorry, the Father is with himself, that's what I meant to say. Um, it's the Father being with the Son, you see. Furthermore, uh, we have a past tense. Um, I won't um, 
hurt your ears with my terrible pronunciation of Greek, but which I had is the imperfect tense of the Greek verb echo. And it implies an action in time past, because it's a past tense, specifically before the creation. The glory which I had with you before the world was. The, the context from verse 1 is the father and the son, because the word father is used in John 17.1, and the word son is used in John 17.1. So the son is said to exist parasoi, literally alongside the father in eternity. I feel my opponent, um, despite his zeal, I, I feel he's wrong about this verse. How the, the context of this chapter somehow disproves John 17.5, where Jesus is speaking plainly, I, I really fail to see that. But if you look at John 17:24, it seems to back up um, my interpretation. Father, I desire that they also who you gave me may, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. For you loved me from before the foundation of the world. Well, if the Father loved the Son from before the foundation of the world, I really do believe the Son must have existed together with the Father before the foundation of the world, which is exactly what John 17, 5 says, which is why a verb in the past tense is used. Um, I think I've covered most of the points, so I pass the mic. And then uh, I think after that, when one God has had his response, I think it's his turn to raise a verse. Uh, over. Okay, thank you very much, Limey. Um, uh, you raised a contention against uh, uh, Revelation 13:8, but when we read 1 Peter 1:19 through 20, um, it seems to verify Revelation 13:8. Um, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Um, who by him do believe in God that raised him from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God um, the blood was shed uh, one guy you dropped your mic come back up please okay can you start my time again please yep go ahead continue we were reading from uh, 1 Peter 1 19 through 20 with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was ordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him from the dead and gave him glory. John 7:39 says, "For the lamb was not yet slain, for Jesus, or for Jesus, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, for Jesus was not yet glorified. His glorification refers to him being slain. He was slain." from the foundation of the world. His precious blood was shed in the plan of God. And that's what John 17:24 says that the apostles, or the disciples then, later to become the apostles, were about to witness. And uh, they, were about to, they were about to witness the glory that he had with the Father. Now, he talked about the passage, uh, uh, he talked about with in John 17:5. Well, 1 John 1, I'm sorry, 1 John 1, 1, 2. Let me turn there real quick, please. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show it unto, and show it unto you, that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. Now, eternal life was with the Father. Now, who was God giving eternal life to? Uh, Jesus was the eternal life through his flesh, not because he was God the Son. John 5.23 says nothing about God the Son. And that's not what the passage says. That's not what the passage is about. I passed the mic. I guess it's uh, my turn to raise a point. Correct, Limey? Yes, sir. That is correct. Come God, it's your turn to raise a point. Go ahead, sir. Okay. Uh, John 5:23. Let me turn there. I know someone's got it up here, but I want to read it from the uh, from my scriptures in front of me, please. 
Okay, uh, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth the Son honoreth not the Father, which hath sent him. Now, notice the notice the the end of the passage that talks about sending. Now, my opponent would say that that sending means that he came from eternity, but John uh, six fifty one tells us exactly how the Son was sent and what exactly was sent. Let me turn there, please. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall. And the bread I will give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Now, that, is, that clearly tells us how the Son was sent. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eats this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread I will give is my flesh. The, the bread that came down from heaven, and flesh and blood, does not come from heaven, but God had provided that flesh from the foundation of the world and it came to be manifested, Gal Galatians 4.4, 4, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. The son was made of a woman made under the law. To deny that is to deny the very scriptures. And um, that is, God had provided that flesh from heaven as he, just like he provided manna from heaven for the children of Israel. And uh, that is what, that's what saves the, uh, the sinless flesh of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 21. Um, okay. Um, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread I shall give is my flesh. Okay, thank you very much. Limey. Well, first of all, I do not deny that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has a human nature. In John 6:51, he's clearly alluding to this human nature when he says, "I am the bread, and I give my, uh, I give this um, for the life of the world." So it wasn't his deity that died; it was his, his humanity that died. Remember that death is merely the separation of a human body from a human spirit. The permanent separation of the human body from the human spirit. And that happened on the cross. So I'm not a person who's denying Christ's humanity. I believe that the Son of God is fully God and fully man. The problem I have with my opponent is he seems to be saying that the Son is God's flesh. Now, I've again made another quote um, that my worthy opponent has said, which is this. He said, quote, that which saves is the sinless flesh of Jesus Christ. Well, Unitarians believe that. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that. Um, there are a large number of cults that believe that, that Jesus Christ was a sinless man, and when he gave his sinless flesh, that saves us. Now, I don't wish to impugn my um, worthy opponent uh, with these particular groups, but I think he's making a mistake. Jesus Christ did give his sinless flesh, but Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is fully God and fully man. And this is my problem with my opponent. He seems to be focusing upon Christ's humanity, the humanity of the Son, which I agree with. But he's not confirming the deity of the Son, that the Son is fully God as well as being fully man. And because he's fully God, he possesses every divine attribute. That's why we should honor the Son, just as we honor the Father because the Son is just as much Yahweh God as the Father. Uh, very briefly, Scripture does talk about the Father sending the Son into the world. John 16, 28. Uh, how much time have I got left, please? John 16, 28. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. This isn't a reference to Christ's humanity, but to the deity of the Son of God. Okay, because he has two aspects. He's fully God and fully man. John, which John six fifty one, which my opponent quoted so well, I, I agree with him. Reference to his humanity. This John sixteen twenty eight, a reference to Christ's deity. And very briefly, one John chapter. Oh, I've got to be quick, haven't I? One John chapter three verse eight. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So, who was Jesus Christ? Who was manifested in the flesh? It was the Son of God who was manifested. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Limey Bob. Um, most certainly God was manifest in the flesh, but there's only one passage of Scripture that clearly tells who, who the one God was that was manifest in the flesh. And nowhere do we find in any passage of Scripture that talks about God the Son being manifest in the flesh. That is inferred in every passage that my worthy opponent has put forth, but we do not see that. Uh, anytime he sees Son, Son of God, uh, came forth, he infers that that is God the Son. He, he, inverts, he inverts the passage, and, and instead of the Son of God, it's God the Son, or, or any time that's ever done, that's, that's what we're supposed to see. But I see that not from Scripture, but I do see a clear passage of Scripture in John 14.10 that, that states clearly, the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. The Son said of himself, I can of mine own self do nothing. Now, either God had two sons, an eternal son, and one born of Mary, or we've got conflicting ideas here. Um, the son refers to the flesh. Now, anytime I talk about the son, I'm not talking about flesh only. I do focus on the flesh, but when I talk about the son, I'm talking about God manifest in the flesh. Now, the God in the man was God the Father. There is no God the Son. And, uh, and we see that clearly from John 14.10. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.19, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Which God was in Christ? If God is a trinity, was the trinity in Christ? Of course not. God the Father, we clearly see in John 14.10. The Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. The Son says in John 5.30 of himself, I can of mine own son self do nothing. And, um, and we see that clearly from the scriptures. How much time do I have? Okay, gentlemen, speakers, if you keep track of the text, I'm at least giving you a one-minute warning. So uh, one God, you still got one minute left on the mic. Okay, I dropped again, Professor Preach Bill. I'm sorry, I, I keep dropping here. Uh, I don't get, get to it on time, I guess. Um, he made a couple of points. I, I'm sorry, I don't remember what the points were. But uh, we, do see, we do see in 1 John 1, 1, 2 that eternal life was with the Father. Now, there was nobody back there in eternity for God to give eternal life to. And uh, that eternal life was in the Son. And that's not, he was not literally slain. He was not, no more than he literally existed. And of course, Romans 5.14 clearly tells us Adam was the figure of him that was to come, meaning Jesus was not back there. Adam was made in the image of God. The, invis, the, the visible image of the Son of the invisible God. Thank you very much. Well, I think it's my turn to now speak and to finish up this particular um uh, verse, and then I, I have a verse of my own to follow up with. Um, I didn't get any response to 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. I've been very careful so far to say the word Son of God or the Son, but my opponent said that I keep on saying God the Son all the time. Well, Jade's taking a copy of this debate, and I think if my opponent... Um, uh, plays back that debate in MP3 format, I think it would be rather surprised to say that I have not used the phrase God the Son once to explain my beliefs. I've used the, what the Bible says, the Son of God or the Son. Now, 1 John chapter 3 verse 8 says the Son of God was manifested. I believe that. That's what Scripture says. Who is Jesus Christ? Who was manifested? The Son was manifested. Um, I didn't get a response to John 16, 28. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. I don't think there was a, a proper response on that. I'd like to respond to my opponent's um, comments on 1 John chapter 1, verse 2. We read of the word of life in the epistle, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. And verse 2 says, The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness, and declare to you that eternal life, which was with Pros the Father. So somebody is with the Father, and this is eternal life and we find out who this eternal life is in verse 3 that, we, that which we have seen and heard we declare to you uh, and that you may also have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father 
and with his son Jesus Christ. So who is the eternal life who is cross with the Father in 1 John chapter 1 verse 2? Verse 3 says it's the Son. Again, the problems I had with my opponent, and he said this, quote, God in the man was God the Father. You see, my opponent honors God the Father as the one God of the Bible. He, he doesn't believe the Son is God. He believes the Son is a man who's indwelt by God. And that's a denial of the Son's deity. And I, I've got to bring my opponent back to this repeatedly. The Son is God, Hebrews 1.8. The Son is Yahweh, Hebrews 1.10. The Son is Lord and God, John 20.28, 20, where if you go three verses forward in verse 31, the word Son is used. Another verse my opponent used, I think my time is almost up, is John 14.10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? Well, I believe that. I believe that the Father is in the Son and the Son is in the Father. I, I don't see why I should have a problem with that verse. Um, Trinitarians believe in the doctrine of perichoresis, which teaches that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit mutually indwell each other because they share the same substance. If they didn't, they would be three separate gods. And we know that three separate gods is wrong because there's only one God one God who is one being who has one essence who has one substance and who is the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit which brings me back to John 5.23 that all should honor the Son okay Bob sorry to cut you off but your time is up one God one God your response sir okay uh, thank you very much uh, Limey Bob and thank you um, Professor Preach Bill um, I don't agree with the Trinitarian doctrine of uh, perichoresis, the interpenetration of uh, spirit persons. To me, that is polytheism. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be mean, but I do, I do believe that that is what perichoresis is. Now, there are some, some areas that uh, Limey Bob and myself will agree, um, but in this point, we don't agree. Now, I want to touch on some things that... Uh, he said I didn't deal with. I believe I did deal with him. He said First John 3, 8 and John 16, 28. I gave the passage in John 6, 51 of that which was sent. I am the bread of life, and the bread which came down from heaven, and the bread I will give is my flesh. That's what came from heaven. That's what was sent. That does not mean he literally came down from heaven as God the Son. That means that God provided his flesh as a sacrifice to redeem mankind. And he had that plan from the foundation of the world. Revelations 13, 8 and 1 Peter 1, 19 through 20. I gave both of those passages. Then my opponent, my very worthy opponent, says um, that uh, Jesus is the Lord. And, of course, I believe that. But... He also says that I make a point that Jesus was a man and he was flesh. To deny that is the doctrine of Antichrist. And that's to deny the very passage that John 5.23 is speaking about. Um, that, that is the doctrine in 1 John 4.2. Um, the person that doesn't honor the Son doesn't honor the Father because oneness has both the Father and the Son in the Lord Jesus Christ because John 14.10 says, The Father in me, the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Because Jesus was given the Spirit by no measure in John 3.34. I have never heard any of my Trinitarian opponents deal with that passage of Scripture. Um, John 3.34, uh, God giveth not the Spirit by measure, God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. Unto him being an italics and it added by the translators, because they saw, they saw what was uh, going to be contradictory, that uh, not every Christian receives the Spirit by no measure. If Jesus has the Spirit by no measure, then he, it is immeasurably his. Jesus was a real man, and to deny that is just as bad as to, re, to deny that he was very God. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, one God. Well, it's up to you, Bob, and uh, one God. Do you guys want to go to question time, or do you want to keep replying to each other? It's, it's up to you two guys. Uh, just let me know on the mic what you guys want to do. 
I'm good with the questions. If uh, if Bob is, that's fine. Either way. Okay, we'll start the uh, question and answer session. Whoever has question or answer may raise their hand. If you do not have a microphone, still raise your hand. Have the question typed out in your text box, and then when it's your turn to come up, you can just uh, hit enter and put it in the room. We leave qu questions to three minutes each per speaker or less, and uh, this be questions only. No preaching, people. Do not preach. This is a question answer session. And when you ask your question on the mic, please direct who it is to, either Lamy Bob or uh, one guy. Okay, Mr. Bean, your mic, sir, with your question. Hello. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Bob and, and Oneness for God for an interesting uh, little battle there. <laughs> um, I have a question for one, for one God. Speak up. Okay, go ahead. Is is that a little better? Can you hear me clear now? Right. Uh, my question is uh, concerns John John eight fifty eight, right, where Christ made the statement about himself, before Abra Abraham was, I am. Right. Um, the Jews, the Jews knew exactly what that meant by Jesus saying, "I am," right? Because that is the title of God, as you know. I mean, if 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 Jesus was talking about his pre-existence, why didn't he say, "Before Abraham was, I was"? He didn't say that uh, one God. He said, "Before Abraham was, I am," which is the title of God. And another point I'd like to make: the Jews knew exactly what. Christ was saying because as you know they, they tried to stone him they knew what he meant so he, he's telling you in John um, 8.58 that he is God so would you like to reply to that uh, one God hello yes yes I'm sorry I was hitting the sin button I'm sorry yes I would very much like to reply to that thank you very much for that that question. Yes, all oneness believe John 8:58. We believe that Jesus is the I am. And uh, of course, um, but Jesus was not only the I am, he was a man. His man, his manhood, his sonship, his humanity, his flesh, his body, soul and human spirit had a beginning. I know my opponent doesn't believe in the eternal flesh doctrine, and I don't believe in the eternal flesh doctrine. It was his deity that of that of God the Father that was the great I am, the God of eternity. Uh, but uh, clearly we see in second second Corinthians five nineteen and in John uh, fourteen ten, it was the Father that dwelleth in me and doeth the works. Jesus said of his human son self, I can of mine own self do no works. So yes, Jesus was the I am he was made both Lord and Christ in Acts 2.38. John 3.34, he was given the spirit of the great I Am in John 3.34, which Isaiah 11 and 2 tells us of as the seven spirits of God. Okay, so thank you very much for that question. Um, what I think you have to understand here is that my uh, opponent is playing word games with the word Jesus. One moment he uses the word Jesus of the Son, the next moment he uses the word Jesus of the Father. So where we, where we read in John 8.58, Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you before Abraham was, I am. He's not saying that Jesus here is the Son, because how can you have the Son, who in oneness theology was created in Mary's womb, existing three and a half thousand years ago? In oneness theology, the Son only existed from about 4 BC, when he was born uh, to Mary. In the, in the stable. So that's the first thing to note. Jesus to him there is the Father and uh, before Abraham was I am, that's Jesus. Jesus the Father is the I am according to him. Now go to verse 54 and notice who Jesus is. Jesus answered, 
If I honour myself, my honour is nothing. Notice the preposition. It is my father who honours me. It is my father who honours me. So Jesus is identifying himself as somebody other than the father. Because you can't say the words, my father who honours me. That's Jesus talking about himself. So I, it, is, it is the son who is speaking here. It is the Son who identifies himself as somebody other than the Father. And when we go down to John 8:58, it is the Son who is Jesus who speaks and says, Before Abraham was, I am. Because the Son has eternally existed. You see, the Son has eternally existed because the Son is fully and completely Yahweh God. Yes, 2,000 years ago, the Son took upon him humanity. So Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is now fully God and fully man. I agree with that. But the Son is also fully God. And as God, he possesses divine attributes. The Son is the creator, Hebrews 1.2. The Son is eternal, John 17.5 and John 8.58. Um, anyway, I think I've made my point. The Son is God, the Son is Yahweh, and therefore the Son possesses every divine attribute. And oneness denies that, unfortunately. That's why I believe oneness uh, people, despite their zeal, uh, are, are sincerely mistaken. Uh, next question. Okay, I just got to make sure that I can be heard and I'm not talking to myself. I only do that when I'm not on Pal Talk. Okay, good. Um, uh, my my question would be actually for both gentlemen, and I'm just kind of looking for um, how how they would uh, see uh, <coughs> the three verses that I'm about to give. Daniel uh, seven. Uh, verses 13 and 14, and I'll read them. And it says, And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there he was given a, uh, and, and there was given him a dominion and glory and kingdom, that all people of all languages and nations shall serve him. It is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is that which shall not be destroyed. Uh, the, the, the third and final verse that I will post, and I just like I said, I would like to get um, both speakers' opinions on what this is actually saying to them. I could give you mine, but I'm not involved in this. I'm just, I'm just here to ask questions. Uh, is Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Now clearly the Bible says um, this, is, this is kind of a, uh, this is a parallel of Daniel 7. And it says, But thou Ephra, uh, Bethlehem uh, Ephrata, Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is, to be the ruler of Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Okay, so clearly what I'm seeing in these, in these uh, verses that I'm bringing forth is, is one coming before the Ancient of Days, who, uh, when we read it in context, the Ancient of Days is clearly God. The one that is coming before God is, is, is said to be like the Son of Man. Yet he comes before God. Yet in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, the one that comes before the agent of days, the one that comes before God, is his goings forth have been from old, from everlasting as well. So how do we, how do we interpret this? Um, either or, it doesn't really matter who goes first. Um, Limey Bob, if you'd like to go first, that's fine. But I would like to know how um, you guys would interpret this. Go ahead and uh, take the mic. Well, I think the Daniel passage is quite clear. It's prophetic. It's talking about um, Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. And it's talking about him coming to the Ancient of Days, which I assume would be a name for God the Father. And God the Father that gave unto him um, dominion and glory and a kingdom. So I would imagine the kingdom possibly refers to Acts 2.36, which my opponent has mentioned before. Um, but it does say in Daniel... 7.13, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, and he came to the Ancient of Days. So clearly, you have two here. You have the Son of Man, he comes to the Ancient of Days. As I say, uh, there is no passage to my knowledge that says Ancient of Days is God the Father, but I would, I would assume that, and I would hope that I would be correct in that assumption. If I'm wrong, I'm sure my opponent will um, correct me in that. But certainly, uh, the one who comes to the Ancient of Days is clearly the Son of God. Uh, the Micah passage, um, But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, even though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me 
the one who is to be ruler in Israel's who's going forth have been from old from everlasting although the literal uh, Hebrew in my marginal notes would be from eternity or from the days of eternity well I would see this prophetic of Jesus Christ Jesus Christ was born at Bethlehem um, from the passages I've already quoted which I won't read again we read that it was the Son who was manifested 1 John 3 8 I've read that verse before um, other verses also talk about the Son being sent into the world by the Father, uh, John 16:28. So, although it doesn't say in Micah 5 2, this is the Son, this is the Son of God, I, I would imagine that that is implied, and if you use the New Testament to interpret the Old, I think it's fairly clear that it's talking about the Son. Interestingly, if you read on, uh, verse 3, therefore he shall give them up until the time that she who is in labor has given birth then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel and he shall stand up and feed his flock hmm, seems to be a reference to Christ doesn't it in the strength of the Lord the majesty of the name of the Lord his God and they shall abide they shall abide that's interesting they shall abide that's a plural talking about um, the one who is to be born at Bethlehem and his Lord because he comes in the strength of the Lord so it's interesting that a plural is used there and they shall abide so I just wish to make that point and uh, I think it's uh, my opponent's uh, rebuttal okay thank you very much Limey thank you for your your question also uh, I agree with Limey Bob that uh, both of these passages are prophetic and that they deal with the incarnation, to put it simply. And because Limey Bob brought up the, the passage in Micah, I believe it was 5-4, abide, um, and he brought up the plural, they shall abide. That makes no difference to me uh, about the plural. a matter of fact, I, uh, that's how I interpret uh, Genesis 1-26, and I hope somebody brings that up because I would like to give the oneness view of Genesis 1 26 but because the plural is used it has nothing to do with the plurality of God persons uh, it has to do with uh, with uh, in Jesus all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily uh, there's one real man and one real God and uh, and that's what Micah 5 2 is talking about that's what uh, one like unto the son of man the other passage that was brought up uh, it's both passages are speaking about the coming incarnation and the prophetic. Thank you very much. Okay, my uh, my my question again would be uh, directed at. Uh, I'm going I'm to direct this one at Limey Bob. Limey Bob in, in in Malachi chapter two verse ten, the Bible says, "Have we all not one Father? Hath not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously uh, every man against his brother by profaning the covenant of our fathers?" Um, also in, in, in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 the Bible says that uh, for unto us a son is born unto us a child is given and his name will be called the wonderful counselor the mighty God the everlasting father and the prince of peace and of course in John chapter 14 uh, I believe it's um, um, verse 9 um, I, I don't, I, I don't, I'm not there right now Jesus said um, if you have seen me uh, yes Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just I'm just giving three verses. I'm I'm asking um, uh, if you can address. Um, I'm I'm giving three verses that would back up uh, what I'm claiming. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, then I have to pick one then. Okay. Well, let me let me ask you this, Limey Bob. From the verses that I just gave you, okay, uh, concerning Isaiah nine six, concerning Malachi chapter two verse ten, how do you interpret John chapter fourteen? Um, I believe it is verse 9. Let me, uh, Jay, can you give me a double check? Jesus said, have I been with you so long, Philip, you asked me to show you the Father? And then Jesus goes on to say, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Um, I, it, I, it's, it's, I believe it's, yes, thank you. Jesus says unto him, have I been with you, so, uh, uh, been such a long time with you, Philip, and yet you have not known me? Um, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? So, Lani, in, in light of the verses that I've given you, Malachi 2.10, Isaiah 9 6 we all know what they say how would you exactly uh, interpret um, John chapter 14 verse 9 um, Professor Peachbow looks like he has something to say but uh, um, after Professor uh, comes to the mic if you would address John chapter 14 verse 9 and give us your perspective on how you see John 14 9 your uh, professor your mic 
Okay, just a reminder for each speaker, let me bob and uh, one guy. Gentlemen, you each have three minutes for response to the questions. Nat, uh, if you guys are taking one verse at a time, uh, your total time for each is three minutes. So, uh, I mean, it was Slimy Bob. The question was stored Slimy Bob. So, Slimy Bob, go ahead, sir. Well, there's a lot to cover there, isn't there, in three minutes. Um, sometimes father is used in one sense in the Bible, and sometimes it's used in another sense. We do the same thing in our own culture. I mean, you would say that George Washington is the father of your nation. Okay? That doesn't mean the same thing as George Washington being the father of his son, George Washington Jr. Words can be used in different contexts. Where it says Malachi 2.10, have we not all one father, has not one God created us? This is Hebrew parallelism, where the same thought is repeated in a poetic way. It's repeated twice with slightly different takes on it. So father parallels to God. And all it's simply saying is that God is our creator. And because God is our creator, we can call God our father. Um, so, for instance, uh, the Father is said to be our creator in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. He creates Dea through his Son. Uh, the Son is said to be God, uh, who is also creator. Sorry, the Son is creator. In Colossians 1, 13 to 17, you have the word Son in verse 13. And then we read that all things were made by him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. So the Son is the creator of all things. I believe it's Job 33, 4, the Holy Spirit is our creator. So Malachi 2.10 should be understood in that context. It's not saying um, we have one God the Father. The word Father is used in the sense of creator. Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? So it's, the context in Malachi 2.10 is creation. And in the New Testament, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are revealed as our creator. Um... In John 14, 9, Jesus is not saying that he physically see that if you look at him, you're physically seeing God the Father with your physical eye. Um, the Greek language has several words for see. So in English, we could say, I can see the Statue of Liberty. Okay? Or we could also say, I can see how a piece bios works. All right? Now, you're using the word see in two different senses. If you can see the Statue of Liberty, in Greek that would be blepo, it means to see with the eye. But if you say, I can see how a computer BIOS works, in Greek that's the word horeo, which means to understand. Now, if Jesus had said, he who has blepo me, okay, has blepo the Father, it would be pretty conclusive proof that Jesus the, the Son is the Father, which neither Trinitarians or oneness Pentecostals believe. But Jesus uses the word horeo in John 14, 9. He basically says, if you see me, you can understand the Father. Okay? Because Jesus reveals the Father. Jesus is not the Father, because if you go to the next verse, John 14, 10, he doesn't say, I am the Father. He says, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. If the Father is in Jesus, then Jesus is not the Father. Jesus is somebody who has the Father in him, and he is in the Father. Half the mic. Uh, I guess it's my turn. I'm not going to deal with the passages uh, that were brought up, Malachi 2.10, uh, John 14.9. Uh, there's no need to. They stand as they are. Uh, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is that which is seen of that which is not seen. Okay? Uh, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, that which makes God God. Okay? Uh, some, another passage I want to bring up about the Father is found in Mark 13:32. Um, let me turn there real quick. Um, but at that day and that hour knoweth no man, knoweth no man. Let's see. But that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father only. Now, how is it one person of God knows the time of 
the second coming and the other person doesn't? Well, because the Son is the humanity that is incarnated by the God that we see in John 14.10. Now, my opponent wants to deny that the Son refers to that which was born of Mary. Mary wasn't the mother of God. Mary was the mother of the Son of God, the flesh, body, soul, and human spirit. That's what Mary was... What, that's what Mary, uh, Mary um, birthed was the Son of God. She, didn't, she did not birth God Jr. And this passage clearly says in Mark 13, 32, that the Son didn't even know the time of his own second coming. How is that possible? Um, the Father only. These passages, this is a Father passage. This goes right along with the other pal, the other father passages in Malachi 2.10, John 14.9. Well, seeing that um, uh, one God hasn't responded to the question which was asked on Malachi 2.10 and John 14.9, I would like to respond to what he said because he's brought up completely new material and I think it's only fair that I have uh, the chance to reply to it. The first thing I'd like to say is he brought up Colossians 2.9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. See, my opponent does not believe the Son is Yahweh God, as I do. He believes the Son is a man in whom Yahweh God indwells. A belief very similar to the ancient uh, um, belief known as adoptionism. He also said, quote, The Son is the humanity which was incarnated. Now, if you've listened to what I've said repeatedly, and I will say it again, I deny that. I believe the Son is not just the humanity. I believe the Son is fully God and fully man. I believe Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is fully and completely 100% Yahweh God, and he is also full and complete humanity. My opponent denies that. That's why he quoted Mark 13:32, no man knoweth the day or the hour. A verse beloved by Jehovah's Witnesses and Unitarians and other people who, like my opponent, deny that the Son is God. Because my opponent does deny the Son is God. That's why he doesn't honor John 5.23. He doesn't honor the Son equally to the Father. Because, as he said, quote, he said this, quote, The Son is the humanity which was incarnated. He denies that the Son is both God and man, as I believe firmly the Bible teaches. Um, okay, thank you. Um, I pass the mic. Okay, are we supposed to deal with a question, or deal? Am I supposed to deal with that? Well, you can uh, either respond to uh, what Bob just said, or move on to the next question. It's up to you. I got my hand raised, so I got a question. This will be towards uh, one guy. But, well, God, if you want to respond to Bob, go ahead, sir. Uh, go ahead and ask your question. You do not believe that Jesus Christ is God, okay. In other words, pre-existence before he was born. Luke one thirty two states, He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Because we know that through the, that in order to rule on David's throne, according to Jewish genealogy, they had to show that the genealogy of Jesus Christ went back to the son of David. And verse Luke 1, 33, And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So if Jesus Christ is not God, okay, in other words, pre-existent, who's going to reign over the house of Jacob, in whose kingdom shall be no end. Is it going to be the Father's kingdom, or is it going to be Jesus' kingdom? And that's my question to you. One, one guy, go ahead. Okay, I got the gist of your question. Well, that's the very thing that Isaiah 9 and 6 says. Uh, of his kingdom there shall be no end. For in him, you know, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily that, uh, that Limey Bob dealt with. Um, I believe that Jesus pre-existed because Jesus was given the Spirit by no measure. Now, my, my, my good friend Limey Bob, my new friend, has not dealt with John 3.34. God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. Now, why is God given the Spirit by no measure to God? Now, that seems awful funny to me. That seems like 
that, I'm not trying to be mean again, but that sounds like polytheism to me. Um, this seems very, very... Um, these questions are not being followed through, but Isaiah 9 and 6, of his kingdom there shall be no end. He was given the kingdom because he was made both Lord and Christ. Now, I know that my opponent does not believe that his flesh born to Mary was an eternal flesh, that it always existed. I know that he doesn't believe. I know my opponent surely must not believe that God had two sons, one eternal and one not eternal. Now, what do we have in Jesus? Do we have some mixed hybrid new species? Uh, uh, a hybrid mix? I've mentioned nothing about natures. I'm not talking about natures. Natures don't die. People die. A man died. Um, it was a real man. And a, a God cannot die. It was not God the Son that died. It was the real man that died. First Corinthians. Okay. Okay, one got are you done, sir? We'll bring it up there a little bit. Yes. Okay. Let me, Bob, would you like to uh, make a response or move on to the next question? Okay, I'll respond to that. Um, well, firstly, with regard to Jesus Christ, not ha uh, let me read the verse, John 3, having the Spirit without measure, John 3, 33, I think it was. Uh, I know the verse, but I forget exactly where it is. Is it John 3, 33 or John 3, 34? For he if John 3, 34. Um, for he whom God has sent speaks the word of God, for God did not give the Spirit by measure. The reason for that, that verse is because it's talking about the Holy Spirit when it says Spirit without measure, right? Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit are the same Spirit, okay? They're not separate gods. You don't have God number one who's the Father and a separate Spirit who's God number two and then a separate Spirit who's God number three. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit share the very same single nature, being of God, which is the Father. Okay? Because the Father begets the Son, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from both the Father and the Son. So this is why Jesus Christ has the Holy Spirit without measure. He is the same God as the Holy Spirit. Now, I have the Holy Spirit living within me, other Christians have the Holy Spirit living within them, but they only have a certain uh, limit, a certain... Um, they don't have the fullness of the Holy Spirit because I'm not God. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is Yahweh God, and therefore he has the Holy Spirit completely without measure. Um, now I forgot what the other... Could people remind me what was the other question? It's getting late. It's midnight here in the UK, and I've forgotten what the other question was. Um, what I wanted to stress anyway with that verse... Oh, yes, I know, Isaiah 9.6. What I wanted to stress was that he has the fullness of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit and the Son of God and the Father are all the same deity. They're all the same one single spirit. And um, you can't chop them up and say he has a... Um, well, that's, that's, that's the answer. The second thing, Isaiah 9.6, my opponent has ignored the word son in Isaiah 9.6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Now, my opponent said Jesus, and yes, Jesus is the son. But when he says Jesus, he implies the father, that the, the father will have the government upon his shoulder. Uh, let's read that, Isaiah 9.6 and 7. You'll find it's the son who has the government. For unto, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, the son's, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Father of Eternity, Ab Adan, a Hebrew construct, the Prince of Priests. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom. So it is the son who has the government upon his shoulder. Okay. Uh, uh, no, uh, Limey, I uh, believe you're you're wrong there. Um, I believe the son would have the son would have the government upon his shoulder, but he was given that by God. Uh, Isaiah 11 and 2. He was given the seven spirits of God. 
John 3.34, he was given by the Spirit by no measure. I agree with most of what you said. Sorry, that was, uh, I'm sorry. Okay, gentlemen, due to time restraints, let's move on to our next question. Mr. Product, sir, your mic with your question. Yeah, thanks. Uh, by the way, I for the time I was here, I thought it was a respectful debate, and I appreciate that from from Bob and and One God. Typically, you don't get that, so uh, I appreciate that from both of you. My question is for One God, and I'm not quite sure whether or not Limey uh, Bob brought this up or not. <clears throat> in uh, in John chapter eight, um, specifically verse eighteen. Um, as a matter of fact, starting in verse 17, it says, In your own law it is written that the testimony of two men is valid. Verse 18 says, I am the one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. My question is, wouldn't this destroy, if, if Christ, if, if oneness is true, wouldn't this really kind of destroy Christ's reference to the testimony of two witnesses to validate his ministry? Um, and... I was I was going to bring up another verse uh, in Matthew 3:16. I think the Father speaking from heaven, the Spirit descending, um, as a testimony and a witness to His ministry. But if if this idea, yeah, that's fine. John John chapter 8 and in verse 18 is specifically what I'm asking. Verse 17 and 18 wouldn't this destroy uh, uh, Christ's ability to reference uh, to two witnesses if in fact they are one and the same? Thanks. Uh, uh, can I answer? Okay. Um, uh, no, absolutely not. The two witnesses does not destroy oneness. Um, what we have here is we have one real man and one real God in the incarnation. That's what the incarnation is. Um, I, oneness does not mix the two for a hybrid new species, um, we have uh, we have one real man and one real God in the incarnation. If because Jesus said, "I'm a witness," and the Father is a witness, or however that's worded, but there's two witnesses. If so, then if that's so, then what we're doing is denying Jesus' real humanity as one of those witnesses. The testimony of two, it makes no difference. It's not talk, It doesn't say two persons of God. It says two witnesses. Okay? There are two witnesses, one man and one real God. Okay, one God is... You're all done with your uh, answer there, sir? And... Okay, let me bob your response, sir. Well, I want to keep things polite, but um, again, I have smoke coming out of my ears and my nose. Um, listen to this. Let, let's try and understand one God, three, one not three position. This is what he said. I wrote it down. Quote, we have one real man and one real God in the incarnation. I'm going to read it again. Think about his words carefully. Quote, we have one real man and one real God in the incarnation. You see, he doesn't believe the Son is God. He's been saying all night that he believes that the Son is the flesh. The Father is the God, the Son is the flesh. So the two witnesses that he sees are one, the Father, who is the deity of Jesus, uh, and two, the Son, who is the flesh of Jesus. That's why the title of this debate was chosen, John 5.23 that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. My opponent, for all his zeal, and I could admire him for that, and he's a courteous man, but I think he's mistaken because he doesn't honor the Son as God. Is the Son God and only God? No, the Son is fully God and fully man. You'll find Luke one thirty-five talks about the humanity, that Jesus Christ, the Son, is fully fully man, fully human, and Hebrews 1.8, John 20.28, 20, Hebrews 1.10, uh, Matthew 3.3, 3, quoting Luke 40, 
verse 3 all talk about the Son being fully, completely Yahweh God. Now, let's go on for John 5, 8. John, let me slow down. It's past midnight and I'm tired. Okay, unfortunately this is a disadvantage for me in these debates because I'm five hours ahead of the Americans, so I get very tired. Let me slow down. John 8, 18. Okay, I am one who bears witness of myself. My Father who sent me bears witness with me. I've dealt with the fact that he's denying the deity of the Son. Let's go on to John 8, 24. And bear in mind that the word I am, ego in me, refers to the um, Exodus 3.14, Yahweh, okay? Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Who is the speaker? Go to verse 28. Then Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. So it is the Son who is the I am. And my opponent's denying that. He's saying the Son is not God. He's only God's flesh. And John 8.24 says, if you deny that the Son is the I am, you will die in your sins. This is a salvation issue. Salvation issue. Okay, thank you, Lobby Bob. That is one. Your question, sir. God is one. You got your hand raised, sir. If you're in the room, type a one, please. God is one. You in the room? Okay, so your question. Go ahead. Okay, now you can hear me, I'm sure. Uh, since uh, uh, Jade is recording the bait and really can't um, take the mic, I'm, I'm going to ask a question for him. Um, in the baptism of Jesus, okay, we have the Father saying, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. We also have the Spirit, the Holy Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Um, would, would both speakers address um, how they would uh, view um, the baptism of Jesus Christ? Okay, because again, we have the Father, uh, a voice coming out of heaven saying, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. We have the Son, okay, being baptized. We have the Holy Spirit descending upon him like a dove. So how would a uh, how would both um, interpret this? And Jade, I hope I asked that uh, the way you wanted me to ask it. Okay. Um, good. Okay. So uh, for both, Lime, how would you see that? And and uh, uh, one one God, uh, how would you see that as well? The baptism of Jesus Christ. I'd like to answer that if you don't mind first, Lime Bob, since you went last. Okay, um, what we have is uh, a voice from heaven, the spirit descending as a dove. Um, what we have is uh, manifold manifestations of God. It doesn't matter if a thousand donkeys would have walked up and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Um, a voice, the spirit descending of a dove, it does not make multiple persons of God. I don't care. I don't care if a thousand donkeys walked up and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Um, that's not what we're seeing at the baptism of Jesus Christ. Um, Balaam's donkey that talked. That God, God manifests that donkey to talk. Um, it does not make multiple persons of God. It's just that simple. Um, no, I'd like to address uh, something else, Lime, if you don't mind. Oh, well, hold on, one God. You haven't addressed the scripture. The question was that how do you address the voice coming from the heaven, the Holy Spirit descending on a, descending from heaven in the form of a dove and landing upon Jesus? So. If you can come back up, you've got two minutes left, and uh, please explain the scripture specifically that uh, God has one to ask. Go ahead, sir. You've got two minutes left. I did address it. A voice and a spirit descending as a dove is not two persons of God. Um, it's just that simple. Um, there's nothing further to explain. Balaam's donkey that talked was not a person of God. God simply manifested his power that way. We do not have persons of God. Okay, thank you. Remind me, Bob, uh, you rebuttal, sir, or response? 
Well, first of all, I think it's very interesting to hear what my opponent says. He, he said at this very start of his talk, quote, we have multiple, sorry, we have manifold manifestations of God here. I'll read it again, quote, we have manifold manifestations of God here. So he's very critical about Trinitarians. I've, I've not um, used any Trinitarian terms in my explanation. I've just used biblical terms. I've just explained scriptures using scriptural terms. Um, but he has to use um, non-biblical language. He has to talk about multiple manifestations, um, which is very strange. You know, I don't see the word manifestations in the plural. Anyway. Um, where the, the scripture says here in Matthew 3, 16 to 17, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased, the person who would be saying the son would be the father. So it's, it is, I believe, God the father speaking. He's speaking of his son who is in the water. Now, the father would be Yahweh God, fully, completely Yahweh God. The son who is in the water is both God and man. He has two natures. He's fully, completely Yahweh God. He is also fully and completely a human being, a man. We then find the Holy Spirit descends upon him like a dove, um, probably to indicate that this isn't the Messiah. I would imagine I could be wrong to John the Baptist. Um, so that would be really my, my answer to this verse. Um, scripture reveals, you see, that there is only one God. There's not three gods. There's not three spirits. There's not three thrones in heaven. There's not three gods. There's only one God. And that is throughout the whole of the Bible. There is one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. But as Scripture progresses, it, it, it gives us a, a clearer revelation as to who this one God is. And the Father is revealed as this one God. He is called God the Father, Galatians 1.1. 1, 1. The Son is also revealed as God, Hebrews 1.8. John 20.28 20, calls the Son Lord and God. And Hebrews 1.10 calls the Son, uh, it applies the term Yahweh to the Son, just as Matthew 3.3 3 also applies the term Yahweh to the Son. And the Holy Spirit is called God, Acts 5.3 and 4. So who is the one God of the Bible? Well, Scripture is revealing this. It's revealing more than it revealed in Genesis 1. You don't get the whole revelation of who God is in Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. The one God of the Bible is revealed as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that really is what Matthew 3.3 3 is revealing to us. Thank you. Okay, God is one. Your question, sir. Uh, now, I would like to go back to the, the, to the point. I believe the Trinitarians deny the sonship of, uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ in his humanity. Um, Mary was not the mother of God, and, and God did not have one eternal son and one human son. Um, we go back to something that is, is ignored many times, and that is um, in Acts 2.36, Jesus was made, made both Lord and Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, um, 45, um, Jesus was made. Okay, and one got on sir to got you, sir. That was Bob's rebuttal. Uh, we'll move to the next question, sir. So, uh, got us one. It's your mic. I'm sorry to read got you one, God. Uh, got us one. Your question, sir. Well, I'm, I'm actually kind of torn uh, between uh, two questions um, that I could ask. I'm trying to figure out uh, which would be the better to ask because I'm actually going to get going here very shortly. I want to uh, watch a movie with my with my baby boy and and uh, um, and my wife as well. Um, so I'm kind of debating between two questions to ask. One could be Luke 22 um, when Jesus was praying in the garden, um, um, or it could be Hebrews 1 2, um, which which the, in my opinion the Bible clearly states that God created the world by his son. Well, if you take into account the creation account of how God actually created, um, to me it's very clear that God is calling his word, the same word that was with him in the beginning, that was with him, um, created all things, which would be an actually a pretty, a pretty accurate ex uh, explanation, in my opinion, of Genesis 126. Um, so I'm actually kind of debating between the two. So this is what I'll do. I'll go and uh, I'll go and post a question from Hebrews one two, and I'm actually gonna I'm going to uh, 
I'm going to post this in the room. I want I want to I want people to see this verse. And um, wouldn't oneness have to deny? Uh, thank you, Philip. Actually, I appreciate that. Wouldn't oneness um, have to deny that the Bible clearly calls uh, the Word by whom God created all things uh, His Son? Uh, because to me, it's very clear in this verse in Hebrews chapter one, verse two, and this is what it says. Everybody can read it. Has spoken to us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, by whom also He made the worlds. Okay. Well, of course, we all know the biblical account of how um, God created. That is found in the in the first book of Genesis. is found in Psalms thirty three. Um, you know, John 1.3, uh, Colossians 1.16, Romans 11.36, Ephesians 3.9. Um, in, in light of what um, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2 would say, wouldn't oneness have to deny uh, that the Bible clearly says that the word in which God created all things, he clearly calls his son. Okay, this is the word of God that made all things. Would oneness, how does oneness explain Hebrews 1, 2? Because to me, uh, you know, in the English, it clearly states... Um, it's actually for both. I'd, I'd like to get both, uh, you know, both speakers' opinions on how they see Hebrews one two. Um, if one guy would like to answer first, that would be fine. If Lyman would like to answer, it doesn't really matter. But to me, it would seem that um, uh, let, let let one God go first, because I'd like to hear his explanation um, of of how he would answer Hebrews one two, which to me clearly indicates that God uh, has done a couple of things with His Word, the Son who became flesh. He's appointed a heir of all things, and this is also by whom He made the worlds. Okay, by how he created. Um, wouldn't uh, wouldn't oneness uh, have to deny Hebrews one two, in the sense that it is written clearly stating that God created the world by His Word, whom He has called His Son. Uh, one God, go ahead and take the mic. Okay, one God, before you come up, take the mic. Uh, you can answer the question that uh, God has want to ask, and then Bob will have a response to that, and then we'll move on to the next person or question. All right, one God, your answer, sir. Go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, I guess... Okay, yeah, one God, you drop the mic. Come up and try it again. One God, sir. You drop the mic. Please come back up and try it again. If he's having computer problems, it might be best for him. It'll only take 30 seconds. Shut down PowerTalk completely, load it up again on his computer, and then it should work properly. Okay, one God, are you in the room? Can you hear me? Tap on one in text or yes. One God, if you can hear me, answer me in text, please, either one or yes. Hey, Brian, how you doing? All right, one God, if you can hear me, exit out of PowerTalk. And come back in. You might have to reboot your Pell Talk. So, totally exit out of Pell Talk. Come back in the room. Then come up to the mic. No, thank you. There's no need to reboot anything. Okay, sir. It's your mic. Uh, God is wanting to ask a question. If you'd like to go ahead, sir. It's your mic. It is your mic uh, responding to Hebrews 1, 2. It's, uh, the question was towards you, and then Bob will have a response. God is want to ask this question about Hebrews 1, 2. Go ahead, sir. You mean that whole time I spent speaking was not heard by anyone? Okay, let me start again. Um, Psalm 33.6 in the Septuagint, I heard uh, our friend mention uh, the Word as, as he is thinking the Word is another person of God. Psalm 33.6 refutes that and tells us in the Septuagint, the Greek of the Old Testament, that the Word, or the Logos, by the Word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Jesus was the Creator because... He was made both Lord and Christ, not because he pre-existed. He was given the Spirit by no measure in John 3.34, and he was made the life-giving Spirit in the Incarnation. And that's the reason why he's the, he's the Creator. The Son is the Creator. There is no God the Son. There was no pre-existent Son. It was the Son's deity that was given him by no measure in 1 Corinthians 15.45-46. The, the, uh, 
that which it, Adam came before the spiritual, not the other way around. And that's what Romans four, uh, Romans four uh, five fourteen says. Adam was the figure of him that was to come, meaning he was not back there. Jesus was not back there. Okay, let me bob your response, uh, then we'll move on to Brian's question. So let me bob your response, sir. Well, I didn't get much of a uh, response to Hebrews 1-2, so let me read that verse. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 2. God, who at various times and in different ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. So God, in verse 1, implies God the Father. Um, although it's talking about creation, the word for worlds there is the Greek word a aeonios, which actually implies time. So it's actually a reference to created time, specifically, rather than um, the physical universe, although, of course, if you create um, time, then it implies you also create the what is created in time, which is the universe, but that's just a technical point. We have a Greek preposition, which is through, which is the Greek preposition dia. Okay? If I go through the door of my apartment, okay, and I go outside of my apartment, then I can't say, well, the door doesn't exist. Okay? I exist. My apartment exists. I have literally gone from inside my apartment through the door outside of my apartment. I can't then turn around and say, well, actually, the door doesn't exist. I haven't gone through it. Okay? You have to take these things absolutely literally. If God, if the, if God the Father creates through his Son time itself, then God the Father is literal. The Son of God is literal, the creation is literal, and so logically, God the Father creating through his Son must also be literal. Um, so you can't dismiss the preposition through as figurative and yet take the other parts of this sentence as literal. That's, that's crazy. Dia is also in the genitive sense. It's a, it's a linguistic possession. Okay? And you can't dismiss a genitive as figurative. Uh, if you can do that, if you can show me an example where a genitive is figurative and doesn't exist, then I'd like you to show me that. Because, you know, if I said the microphone of Limey Bob, you can't say, well, the microphone doesn't exist. Or, or the computer monitor of Limey Bob, another genitive, you can't say, well, that doesn't actually exist. Um, so if I were to say to, I've gone through that door, dear, you can't then claim that while I literally exist, and have expressed a spatial movement, yet the door doesn't exist other than as a thought in God's mind, which is the oneness position. Again, I have to draw people's attention to the fact that what my opponent is doing is he's denying the deity of the Son, but affirming the deity of Jesus. He's doing this repeatedly. He's denying the Son is God, but he says Jesus is God, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is the Creator, because Jesus is his name for the Father. He honors the Father as God, but he doesn't obey John 5.23. He doesn't honor the Son equally to the Father. Uh, next person. Okay, Brian, and for the new people that has come in the room, we just got done with the rebate, and we're having a question and answer session here. Uh, one God, you might have to close down Paul Talk and come back in the room. I see you have gone out of the room and come back in. So you might have to totally shut down Paul Talk and come back in the room. Okay. All right, now you can hear. Okay. All right, Brian, 729, your question, sir, go ahead. Okay, I think there's a problem here. Uh, I hope you all aren't de deifying humanity. Uh, the humanity of Jesus Christ was not deity. Obviously, or when that died on the cross, and we'd still be in our sins. Um, Another co a question I would like to address, if Jesus, okay, if Jesus, the humanity of Jesus Christ is God, did God have a God? Look at John 20 and 17. After he ascended, before, just before he ascended, he said, my father and your father, my God and your God. Now, See, we're, we're running into a discrepancy there. I don't believe the humanity was deity. 
I believe what was inside Jesus Christ, I mean, it was the fullness of the Godhead in him. But do you all believe God had a God? That's what I'm trying to get at. No, I'm not no Jehovah Witness. Uh, I just, uh, closer to probably oneness Christian, oneness monotheism, but not like the United Pentecostal Church. Slight variation. Anybody want to dress up? Go ahead, Derek. God is one. Okay, who would like to go first to uh, Brian's question? One God or Lamy? Who wants to go first? Let me know in text. Who wants to go first? Okay, Lamy, Bob, go ahead first, and then one God will have a response. Well, there's a parallel to this um, this this passage. Um, let me let me read the actual verse. John twenty seventeen. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I, ascending, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Now, as I understand this passage, remember I have defined Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as being fully God and fully man. Jesus is not a third of God. He's not part God. He's not a semi-God. He's not a God, as the Jehovah's Witnesses teach. Jesus Christ is fully, completely, 100% Yahweh God. And he's also a man. He's also a man just as, just, as, just as I am and just as the men in the room are. So, as a man, Jesus Christ has a full human nature. And as a man, Jesus Christ... Sorry, one... Let me just take that back. I have a sin nature, original sin. And so do the other men in this room. Jesus Christ, of course, is different to us in that he does not have a sin nature. Now let me go back to John 20, 17. As a human being, as a man, God the Father is his God. So um, when Jesus says, I'm ascending to my Father, to your Father, to my God, and to your God, as a man, Jesus Christ has a God. And he can speak this way. Because as well as being fully, completely God, Jesus Christ is fully, completely a man. And as a man, the Father is his God. So that would be my explanation. It seems to be a parallel to um, um, Hebrews 1.9, but um, don't have time to go into that. So I'll pass the mic. Okay, one guy, your response, sir. Okay. Okay, I... Okay, I'm sorry, Limey, I don't believe in original sin. I don't believe Okay, well, God, I'm sorry to doubt you, sir. You're breaking in and out. Uh, I don't know if you got something running in the background. Make sure you got nothing running in the background. Uh, come back up and try it again because you were breaking in and out. Go ahead, sir. Coming up. Five. Uh, five. But uh, nature's done. Okay, five minute break is over. Okay, one God, sir, you can come up to the mic, sir, and give your response. Go ahead, sir. Response to what? I've been knocked off for the last ten minutes. I did like a ten minute talk and nobody heard anything I said. I'm I'm sorry, I don't like this format very well. well I apologize if you got knocked off, but uh, we did not hear you in the room, sir. We were breaking up in and out. So uh, evidently, it was either a pal talk or whatever, sir. Um, one one God, um, would you mind just, it will only take you two seconds, Just just leave the room. Come back in again a second time. No need to shut Pal Talk down. Just come in and out of this room, and don't run anything else on your computer. If you run multiple programs on your computer, then Pal Talk hates it, and the memory goes to these other programs and not to the microphone. And that's why people break up. So you've got to run only Pal Talk, nothing else. Don't have anything else on your PC. Leave the room and come back in. And I think you'll find that'll solve the problem. And maybe what we need is to forget what we've said so far and just start a new question. Thank you. Okay, got us one. We'll start with a new question. Go ahead, sir. Your question, got us one. Well, um, I, I hate to beat a dead horse. Um, unfortunately, I can be heard, correct? <laughs> I just got to make sure that I can be heard, too. 
Um, I hate to beat a dead horse, but uh, the, the uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, um, in, in uh, my opinion, was in no way, shape, or form even addressed. Um, to simply state that God created by his word um, means absolutely nothing. This is common knowledge, and it does not affect the Trinitarian view uh, position in, in any way, shape, or form. Matter of fact, it only strengthens it. Um, so I would, I would have to ask the same question once again. Um, if that's okay. And, I, and like I said, I hate to beat a dead horse, but I would like an answer to this. Um, he hath appointed in these last days, uh, he hath in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. Now, there's no distinction here being made, okay, other than the father, okay, has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the wor worlds. Now, if we take into the, uh, account the whole creation method. If you take a oneness position, does this, um, uh, isn't this just a blatant, uh, I don't even know how to word it uh, properly, wouldn't this just be simply ignoring what the Bible says about the Word being the Son of God? Okay, well let me ask a different question. Perhaps you'll hear this question. Um, how, would, how would a oneness explain Philippians chapter 2? Okay. <clears throat> how would a, how would oneness explain Philippians chapter two? I'd like to hear a oneness uh, a oneness perspective on Philippians chapter two. Go ahead, uh, one God. Anyone hear me? Will I be wasting my? Right. This is going nowhere. Um, one God. Um, Jade, Jade has told you what, what to do. When you left the room a little while ago, you were told to shut down PowTalk completely, and I thought you did that. Why don't you try that? Close down PowTalk completely. Make sure that in the bottom uh, right menu on your computer, you click on Exit PowTalk. You've got to Exit PowTalk on the bottom right menu. And then two seconds later, um, load PowTalk in back again. Um, we'll wait for you here, but you, there's, there's no way this is going to continue. It's going to be, you don't want to make any difference. You can't run anything in the background on your computer. You can only have PowerTalk on, nothing else. And what you've got to do is shut PowerTalk down every menu, go to the bottom right screen, click on Exit PowerTalk, you right click, Exit PowerTalk, and then two seconds later, load it on again. And if that doesn't do it, we're going to have to call the debate off, I think, um, because we just can't hear you. Thank you. Man, I, perhaps I shouldn't say this, but I'll just whisper it quietly. I don't, I don't know what's more annoying, um, his answers or his computer. Okay, Bob, I think uh, due to the time restraints, it's 8 o'clock my time. After he responds to Hebrews 1, 2, or Philippians chapter 2, either or, then after your uh, response, uh, I think we ought to end it. And that... Uh, it's getting kind of late here in my time. I know it's late, definitely your time, Bob. I know that. So uh, if that's okay with you after we're this response to this question, then we'll do the closing statements and that'll be it. I was about to have some um, entertainment. I was about to roast Jade Miner slowly over a spit while I quote from Calvin's Institutes. I thought that would be quite entertaining for the room. Yeah, Limey, I don't, I don't have a problem uh, um, if he, uh, if he wants to continue. Um, if he does come back in, um, I guess the question would be most easily addressed if anybody wants to uh, tell him what I said. Um, from the oneness position, wouldn't the oneness position uh, uh, blatantly disregard Hebrews chapter one verse two when it flat out calls the word his son? Okay, one God, you're back, and I assume you can hear me. Just so you know what the question is. Um, according to a oneness position, how do you not blatantly disregard what Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2 says when it clearly says that God has spoken in these last days by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world? Okay? Now, from that perspective, how does oneness not completely disregard what this verse is saying? All right, go ahead and take the mic. you asked me a question, you asked me about Philippians 2.6, which 
which proves the Trinitarian doctrine polytheism. God, you, you say that this passage refers, I know the Trinitarian position is that God the Son, but the Trinitarian position is that uh, God is equal to God in that passage. God cannot be equal to God. As, as I mentioned before, Okay, one God, evidently we're having some technical problems. You're breaking up in and out, in and out, in and out. Okay, uh, it's up to you gentlemen. If you guys want to end the uh, debate right now, do the technical please. Uh, it's up to you guys. Uh, Lami Bob, did you want to end the uh, question session of the debate? Okay. How about you, one God? You guys want to you wanna end the question session? <clears throat> One God, if you can hear me, did you want to end it? Go ahead. Let's try it again. Okay, One God, I'm sorry to doubt you. You're breaking in and out. In and out must be a connection or something. I don't know what it is. Uh, all right. You stop the debate question and answer session. All right. Um, <clears throat> I guess that leaves uh, closing arguments over out of the way, Bob, because uh, I don't know if he's got leg or what, but uh, we're in the debate session right now. Uh, is that all right with you, Bob? Go, come on, come up to the mic. Well, um, I, I think this is going to go nowhere. Obviously, there's computer problems that are very unfortunate, but uh, they can't be helped. So I'd like to thank One God um, for taking part in this debate. It's a shame you've had computer problems for the last hour, but that can't be helped. Thank you for what you've done so far, and thanks for your courage in coming in the room. I appreciate that. Thanks also to Professor Preachbill and God is 110. They've done a wonderful job. Appreciate it once again, and I'd like to remind other people in the room that um, we would like to debate other topics, and I don't want to take part in the next debate or two. I'd like to moderate. So if guests in this room would like to fix up a debate, fix up an opponent, maybe we can sort that out. I'm going to come back in the room with a hat so I can red dot people I don't like, such as Jade. Only joking, Jade. <laughs> um, but um, uh, continue the conversation if you like. And oh, thanks for Jade for recording it. Also, appreciate that, Jade. Thank you. So thanks for everyone. Thank you. Well, I just want to say both speakers did very well. Uh, unfortunately, one guy had some technical problems in that. Um, Jade, thank you, sir, for recording. And God is one. Jim, thank you very much, sir, for helping me uh, moderate the room. I am making this announcement now. I will not, repeat, will not moderate the next one. <laughs> uh, I'm going to take a break from moderating it. So if anybody else, if anybody else sets up a debate, uh, either Jade Miner or God is one or whoever's the admins for Bob's room here can moderate. I'll come in and help but I'm going to pass on the next moderation, Bob. I'm going to take a break. So, But uh, both gentlemen did very well. I want to thank the admins for helping me out. Jade Miner, thank you for recording it, sir. Appreciate it. All right, gentlemen, I am going to kick back and relax and listen in. God bless everybody. <laughs>